Welcome everybody. I'm Miss Chrissy, the children's librarian here at South West Harbor Public Library. We're so excited to have you here. Um, before we get into the introduction, just a few house rules. If you could turn your phone on silent, we'd appreciate it. If you are joining us today virtually, if you could mute yourself, we'd also appreciate that as well. Kate is here running our tech. She's doing a fabulous job. If you have questions and you're online at the end of the presentation, you can either pop them into the chat or you can um, voice it. You can unmute yourself at that time. Um, oh, yeah, a little bit, sure, but I guess you'd be in the way. So we also have some really great programs coming up. So be sure to check our calendar. Thank you very much. Do have any kiddos that are interested in performing in a Color Express extravaganza in December? We're doing a little play and we're welcoming them to be the performers for it. So tonight, without further ado, we're thrilled to host and introduce you to Dr. Stephen Russell, who will be focusing today on the biology and ecology of amphibians and reptiles native to Maine, as well as tropical species. A professor of biology at the College of the Atlantic and former director of the Door Museum of Natural History, Dr. Russell received his master's and PhD from the University of Vermont and University of Connecticut, respectively. He has conducted field work in California, Panama, Costa Rica, and the Caribbean. And more recently, he has been involved with salamander research in Acadia National Park. So without further ado, please help me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Stephen Russell. Thank you very much. So you have to have that sort of stand kind of right here. Just I so. believe a little bit closer to the right. <laughs> So we have a little barrier between it, so let's keep them going, right? Yeah. All right, perfect. Okay. All right. Go check. All right, I will. Actually, I'm just going to yeah. do this. Okay. What's that? We are a go. Perfect. All right, great. All right, well, thank you all for coming tonight. And for those of you who are out there in Zoom land, thank you for attending. And um, especially tonight when we're forecast to have snow tomorrow. It seems a little well, inappropriate or incongruous to have a talk tonight on amphibians and reptiles <laughs> as we enter into winter. Um, so I was thinking like how to start off this presentation tonight. Um, and, uh, and really it's like, I'm game to talk about amphibians and reptiles any time of the year because this boils down to I enjoy them. And I have since I was a little kid. Tonight, I will highlight some of the species that are found here in the title of the talk is Northern New England. I'm using Maine as one of the states that's Northern New England, all right? Um, as well as toward the end of the talk, highlighting a few species that uh, are found in the tropics that are related uh, to some of the species that we have here in Maine. And um, doing so by telling some stories about some of the species. I've decided not to go through the laundry list of all the species that we have here, but rather highlight some of them and um, tell you some stories that I find particularly interesting about some of these species because it really speaks to how remarkable, remarkably diverse the species that we do have here in Maine are when you take some time to, um, to go out and find them and learn about them. And, you know, I um, I remember that uh, when I interviewed for my job at College at the Atlantic a few, I was gonna say years, but decades ago, um, <laughs> that you come, and I came in February, I think it was, it was cold and snowy. And, uh, and you go through a number of days where you are interviewed and you meet with a different you know, groups of faculty and staff and students. And it's the students who ask the probing questions. I still to this day remember two questions that were asked of me kind of right off the bat. One is like, why do you like reptiles and amphibians? Of all the animals that are out there, why amphibians and reptiles? And the second question is, is that if you do come to Maine and College of the Atlantic, what will you do since you like amphibians and reptiles? Because this is Maine and it's cold and snowy for a good part of the year. And that speaks to the fact that Maine is not synonymous with amphibians and reptiles. We have our lobsters, we have our whales, we have our moose, and, but uh, frogs and snakes and turtles don't immediately come to mind when you think of the state of Maine. Um, that second question was easy to answer, which I'll get to in a minute. That first question that spoke to my personal interest was one in which I never really thought about, uh, just 
since I was a kid, I liked amphibians and reptiles. But they answered the question, well, why? You know, I thought, well, yeah, why do I? And um, and I've thought about that a lot over the years, and people have asked me that, that you know, at various times. And as a kid, I don't know, I, I, as a kid, it was a simple answer because you could pick them up and hold yeah. them and you could look at them. And you can't do that with a lot of animals. I actually, sort of my first love or obsession was tropical fish, but you can't really pick up and hold tropical. I mean, you can, but it only goes so far, you know, it's from the fish's end, but a frog and a snake, you can. Um, but at some point I sort of, you know, spilled over to um, amphibians and reptiles. But I've come to um, the conclusion that the reason why I'm so fascinated by them is because they are so different than us, us being mammals. They just live out their lives with us, but in such a different way than what we know mammals need to do to survive and reproduce. And that just fascinates me. And I think the other thing that I've come to realize is that I guess I am, uh, you know, uh, uh, fascinated by them because I want to sort of be a champion for the underdogs because reptiles and amphibians have a reputation about them that is one that they've had for a long time. Um, the study of reptiles and amphibians is herpetology. And like, where did that word come from? Well, this is where it came from, from the Greek root for creepy animal. So it was the animals of the world that creeped around and that did not include mammals or birds. And for a while, fish were included in this, but fish were extracted out. Though was left, we were left with the two sort of creeping animal groups of the world. And with that comes, you know, depends on sort of your persuasion, uh, some disparaging perceptions of creepy animals, one in which they can be sort of repulsive or they can even be sinister. These are from some lithographs or artwork taken from the 15th century and from the 19th century of, you know, one in which, you know, the terrible encounter with a toad when family was out for a walk, but here it's a depiction of some artwork done where these sort of half beast, half people are roasting children and they chose them, the beast side of them to be toads for some reason, something about toads, I don't know, anyway. <laughs> Um, and um, <clears throat> Linnaeus, who is sort of the father of taxonomy, the person who came up with naming unique species, a genus and species, he was not without his opinions of these um, organisms that he was naming. And this is how he summarized how he thought about the class amphibia. And you can read that and you can sort of, you know, I think surmise how, you know, he kind of felt about amphibians, although he sort of lumped reptiles in there because he's talking about terrible venom, which you know I'm sure he's referring to snakes. So anyway, I just felt like they need a, you know, they need a champion, <laughs> and um, and I'm one of those people that like both amphibians and reptiles. For my masters, when I was at University of Vermont, I worked on lizards out in California for my PhD at the University of Connecticut. I worked on frogs down in Panama, so I, I like them both. And within the reptiles and amphibians, I sort of have some favorites. Um, so anyway, that's where I am personally. And I have been fortunate enough to sort of carry that childhood fascination with me through being able to get advanced degrees in those fields, as well as a paying job um, with the study of at least partly, you know, uh, the study of amphibians and reptiles and, uh, and, um, and still with me today. So I feel really quite fortunate. So that second question, if I come to me, what will I do, right, in this cold, snowy state? And um, when you consider how many species of the amphibians and reptiles are here in Maine, it quickly adds up. We have, at least according to Maine Inland Fishes and Wildlife, we have nine species of frogs. We have nine species of salamanders. We have 10 species of snakes, but we actually have nine species. I'll tell you in a second. And we have eight species of turtles. We don't have any lizards. Um, and in these four groups of herps, um, the timber rattlesnake is always included in state lists because we so want to have the timber rattlesnake <laughs> when it was extirpated from Southern Maine. Um, 
about a century ago, and the state always holds out hopes of either finding a uh, isolated population or maybe reintroducing them, because they are in New Hampshire and Vermont. It's not the cold that, that keeps them out of Maine, it's people. Um, and that of the salamanders, there's a non-native introduced uh, species, and uh, for a turtle, a non-native introduced species. So of all these species, the ones that have arrows to the right, I'm going to show you pictures of and tell you some stories around them. Some of the stories are short, some are longer. And all these stories, as I said, are meant to highlight just the fascinating lives that they live, uh, just to give you a taste of, um, of how they live out their lives, most of the time out of sight. And I'm gonna start with the spotted salamander, which is a species that's sort of close to my heart and spend a little time because I wanna use the spotted salamander to go through sort of a typical life cycle of an amphibian and then use that as a basis of comparison for some other species of the amphibians of how they differ. So spotted salamanders are a robust, beautiful, uh, species of salamander that often is not seen for two reasons. One is it spends about 50 weeks out of the 52 week year underground. You don't see them or you just oftentimes you can't or not oftentimes, sometimes you can find them. They just sort of happen to be out and about outside the breeding season, but most of the time they are underground. But for about two or two and a half weeks out of the year, they come above ground and they reproduce, but they do it at night and they do it at a really crappy time of the year. In late March, early April, you know, I don't have to tell you, you live here on the island, what late March and early April is like. So you really have to make an effort to get out of the house to see them. And it's hard some when it's cold, rainy nights and the wind. And anyway, <laughs> so this is a cold adapted salamander. It can, you know, in the early spring when it comes above ground and it is migrating to breeding pools, encounters snow and ice. And it's it's slowed down like metabolically, but it's undeterred dealing with the cold. Um, and so uh, once it gets to a, a breeding pool, it is a pretty chaotic um, set of events where males and females gather and it's called scramble competition and explosive breeding where they all come together for a short period of time. And males lay down these little packets of sperm. So they don't class the female. They will court a female. Then when they think they have her attention, they'll deposit these packets of sperm. And this is what they look like, this sort of gelatinous stalk, and then here's the sperm, and then the female will pick them up with the male not around, and then she will lay her eggs. And then the eggs develop after the adults have left, so there's no parental care, that's the eggs are on their own, you can see here they're, they're newly laid eggs, and oh, I'm supposed to use the pointer, but I guess my finger works, so maybe it's are developing a little bit further along. And um, the embryos hatch out, and then we have these larval salamanders that have, unlike frog tadpoles, have four legs upon development with these big feathery gills. And then we'll go through a larval development in the water, and then we'll metamorphose, come on land, and mature into adults. And um, several years later, we'll start breeding. So typical amphibian lifestyle where the adults are on land, the reproduction happens in the water, the larval form is in the water, and the adult form is on land. Some of you who go out and see this big night um, in the spring um, will sometimes, I bet, see egg masses that have a greenish cast to them. The embryos are developing, and uh, uh, people can think, well, these are egg masses that are dying. They've been being invaded by scum or whatever. And um, and um, and they they are non-viable, but it's actually the exact opposite. What you're seeing is symbiotic algae that is in each individual um, egg capsule that is there to um, well, it's there. It's a the, it's complicated. <laughs> the, uh, depending on where the algae is, it can be a true symbiotic relationship where the developing embryo will extrude waste in the form of nitrogen. The algae use that as a, <laughs> new, new, uh, a source of nutrition. 
and the algae will photosynthesize and produce oxygen, which the embryo uses um, as it grows. But some of the algal cells are inside the cells of the embryo. And there, they obviously do not have access to light, so they can't photosynthesize. And it's still not entirely um, clear how the algal cells inside the cells of the developing embryo, like why the cells, the algal cells stay there. We do know that embryos that are developing that have the algal cells do better in development than those salamander uh, larvae that do not have it. But studies have shown that algal cells don't fare so well inside the cell. They do fine here, but not inside the cell. They don't have access to light and they have to resort to fermentation, which is anaerobic respiration like yeast in making bread um, to make energy. Um, but it uh, yields lower amounts of energy and they have less access to nutrients than when they're outside here but they kind of survive. And so anyway, it's an ongoing open question of like, why doesn't the algal cells just confine themselves to here? Um, so anyway, it's, um, uh, it, uh, it's been known for over a hundred years that there's symbiotic algae, but it was only in 20, 2017, I think that they found them inside um, the embryo. And they're inside the embryo because they're inside the female. Okay. So it comes with the eggs. It's amazing. So they don't invade through the water. Um, the DNA of the algal cells are found in the adults, both males and females. Okay. Another salamander we have here in the island that's native to northern New England is one of my favorites. It's the Ford Code salamander. That's called a four toed because all the other salamanders we have here in Northern England, they have five toes in the back, but the salamander has four toes in the back. But these are small salamanders, unlike a spotted salamander, which is kind of the fist bull. These are about the length of your little finger. And um, they are in a group of salamanders that are commonly referred to as lungless salamanders. They lack lungs. And so all the respiration the taken in of oxygen, the release of CO2 from metabolism happens through their skin and the skin has to stay moist or they can't breathe. So when one of these lungless salamanders starts to dry out, they suffocate before they desiccate. Mm -hmm. um, these also migrate in a little bit later in the spring and uh, they make their way to sphagnum hummocks, to mounds of sphagnum because the fee, that's where the females lay their eggs in sphagnum up above the water and the eggs develop into tadpoles. And when the tadpoles are at a certain stage, they hatch out and they make their way through the sphagnum into the water and then they live out their larval stage and then go through metamorphosis. What's interesting is, is that the females can lay their eggs communally and that the last female to deposit eggs in a certain section of sphagnum mounds will stay there and protect her and all the other eggs. And the question is, is how does the female know she's the last one? <laughs> um, and there's also the question, a little salamander, how could they defend those eggs? You know, and so the thing it is, is maybe the defense is more in the form of keeping the eggs clean of mold. Um, and uh, they don't have to keep them moist because the sphagnum moss is going to stay moist. So um, anyway, that's also an open question. Here's another salamander that uh, is um, a newt, although newts are salamanders. And this is uh, the uh, Eastern newt or the red spotted newt or um, on land, when you see this, we call it the red F. But uh, red F is the Eastern newt. It's the juvenile stage of the Eastern newt. So in this case, the juvenile larval stage is on land and the adult stage is in the water. So newts breed in the water. And uh, let me just go through here. So these are bright orange, it can be bright red, and they're active during the day, they're diurnal, and I'm sure you have seen them. It has to be moist, oftentimes like after a rain, you see them. 
um, walking around in the leaf litter. Um, but they um, are uh, uh, a, um, they're a, a salamander that doesn't stay hidden under cover of night or under cover of leaf litter because the bright coloration is um, warning coloration. They're unlike some species of poison dart frogs, they would not kill you if you picked them up or if you ate them, you know, probably you would know that you ate it. So it's more unpalatable than it is toxic, um, but to predators, it's enough to deter them. And when they're threatened, they can um, display this characteristic behavior. It's called the unkin reflex, where they arch their back. And it's, I think it's a way to sort of really advertise how bright they are to a predator that may is still kind of finding out whether it's unpalatable or not. And uh, this is posed because I was like getting to do that. So. <laughs> so at some point, these red apps, they stay on land. They can wander around land one, two, up to six years. And at some point they return to water and they transform into sort of more greenish Eastern newt or red spotted newt, that is their common name. And then they breed in water, males and females will, um, uh, uh, males will court, they will amplex and the female will lay eggs. The eggs will hatch out, the larval form will, uh, uh, the tadpoles will be in the water, or the larval newts will be in the water for a short period of time, and then they exit as red Fs. However, in some populations in Maine and throughout the range of eastern newts, sometimes the larval newts never exit as red Fs. They stay in the water and they retain their feathery gills, but they also sexually mature and they reproduce as sexually mature juveniles. It's called pedomorphosis, and it's known that that happens in other groups of animals. And the question is, was like, why do you see that in some populations, but in other populations, they exit and they sexually mature into adults. And in other cases, they say in, um, you know, at least part of their body in juvenile form. And again, that's kind of an open question is why that, what may be driving that, whether it's genetics or whether it's ecological that, in some populations, it's riskier to be on land than just staying in the water itself. But anyway, I find that really intriguing. All right, back to lungless salamanders, the ubiquitous red-backed salamander. Uh, it's the most common vertebrate in um, the Northeastern United States. And um, common name, it's well-deserved, the red-backed salamander. However, there's also a lead phase redback salamander that lacks the red stripe. And on Mount Desert Island, we have one of the higher um, uh, uh, proportions of finding lead phase redback salamanders in other parts of Maine, even sort of nearby. Um, you see a lot more of these than you do in other parts of Maine. Um, as you can imagine, it's, you know, it's prompting questions like why are some redback salamanders red back and others have this lead face and and um again it's somewhat of an unresolved question some people think it may just be sort of genes like in some populations the genes for for coding for um red back is just you know more frequent than in other populations but curiously having a red stripe or not is also associated with a particular particular type of anti-predator behavior so experimentally, they uh, some people have presented both lead back, red lead phase red backs and red back salamanders um, to garter snakes, and depending on whether they have the stripe or not, the behavior that is uh, prompted by being exposed to a garter snake is different in the two phases. Red back salamanders that have the red stripe tend to stay put and arch their back. Whereas lead phase redbacks flee. And the question, how do they know whether they have the red back <laughs> or not to do that particular behavior? Not as probably genetically linked. Um, but whether they flee or whether they arch their back, it seems that whether they are successful at eluding at least the garter snake predator has more to do with whether if, when the garter snake grabs it, they have the ability to um, 
autonomize their tail and just crawl away and leave the snake with the tail. And here you can see it is growing, regrowing its tail there. So, uh, redback salamanders do not go to water the breed. Their uh, breeding ecology is one that takes place on land. They find a moist place under a cover object. The female will lay eggs and that the larval salamander will complete its development in the egg and hatch out as a miniature adult. Wow. So if you put them in water, you'll drown them. They're totally terrestrial salamanders. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, okay. Um, all right, frogs. This is the wood frog. This frog comes out around the same time as spotted salamanders. It's a cold tolerant species. Um, the uh, uh, back to the questions that the students posed to me, like, what would I do here? When, you know, and the you know retaining my interest in, in amphibians. Um, Wood frogs here in Maine are actually on the southern edge of their distribution. They get up into above the Arctic Circle. So they are a cold tolerant species. So much so that they have the capacity to freeze in the winter time if temperatures drop below the a freezing point of water and they're in a hibernaculum on land. They don't go in water, they go under leaf litter under you know, uh, some cover object. Um, but if there isn't adequate snow insulation um, and temperatures drop, they allow their body water to freeze and they can stay, the body water can stay frozen uh, for a certain period of time. And once temperatures raise, then they fall out and they um, will do it again if it drops. A number of years ago, I experimentally froze a wood frog. I read how to do that. And um, please don't do that when you find a wood frog and put it in your freezer to see it frozen and then see it thaw because you have to acclimate it like it's going through fall acclimation. And then, um, but anyway, I experimentally did it and I took it out of an environmental chamber up at the college. And here it is out of it. So um, you can see its eyes are sort of sunk in and its skin is wrinkly because all the water is tied up as ice. And then over a period of 90 minutes, you can see that it slowly started to fall out, that its sort of head became more erect. And you can see here it was gaining some sort of, you know, control over its limbs. And then here it is with its eyes open. So it started at 2.30 at 4 o'clock. It was this, fall out. Yeah. So they, like spotted salamanders, make their way to water and males find females. They clasp, um, lay eggs, and um, in, um, in the case of wood frogs, they, the females can lay 1,000, 2,000 eggs, and they lay their eggs communally. Um, and uh, they lay their eggs in the early spring. And if you stick a, a thermometer in the middle of these communal egg masses, the temperature will be considerably warmer than on the edge. The eggs are jet black and they absorb sun during the day and it heats up the gelatinous egg mass, which accelerates um, uh, development. And they're doing this, we think in the early spring before other species that would be in the water where they lay their eggs would be active, like fish or you know, other potential um, um, predators. Um, and usually that works, although they're not predator free, not so much from vertebrates, but oftentimes invertebrates. These are those sort of pernicious diving bugs that are grabbing an adult wood frog and um, sucking it here. You're not big of wood frogs. Wood frogs are, yeah, they're about this big. They're kind of on this. They're about two thirds like the uh, length of like a typical like green frog. Yeah, so they're smaller. How, how long is that? Or you figured like oh. four inches or something? Yeah, four inches, right, okay. yeah. All right, here's a short story. This is a green frog that isn't green. Mm -hmm. um, these pictures were taken on the island and green frogs, the common name of another type of ranted frogs and ranted frogs are, what we usually think about when we think of what a frog should look like and sort of Kermit the Frog was modeled after, I think. Um, uh, but um, on the island and throughout their range, uh, 
uh, green frogs can sometimes have blue pigment in really striking way. Um, it can be sort of partially blue or it can be all blue, wow. right? And it all has to do with whether an individual lacks the capacity to put down yellow pigment or not, because yellow will interact with the um, reflect, refracted light coming from the atmosphere that the blue plus yellow equals green. So if it lacks the yellow, then it's going to appear green. Sometimes when they age, it, the blue will be taken over by green, but oftentimes they're that. And uh, they're thinking that those, that gene that codes for the lack of yellow pigment is kept really low in a population because these things stand out <laughs> big time and actually have higher predation rates. So this is a sort of downward aerial view of a spring peeper. And I love these interplays sometimes of common names and species names. So the spring peeper as we know it, but its species name is Sudacris crucifer. Crucifer means cross bearing. So spring peepers have a cross on their back, but the common name comes from the peep that they make in the springtime, the spring peepers. But I mentioned that because not all male spring peepers peep. In a population, there can be those that call, and then there's there, those that don't call, and they sort of hunker down next to a calling male and wait for the calling male to attract a female. They come over and they will usurp that female. These are referred to as satellite males. And um, they'll have that reproductive strategy that's kept in lower frequencies than calling males because they always need a calling male. You can imagine they, they could never take over because there'd be no male to exploit, but yeah. Oops. Um, I wanted to come back to this because spring peepers are not a ranid. They're in a group of frogs that are commonly referred to as tree frogs and um, because they can be found above the ground. Not so much spring peepers. They don't get that high off the ground when they're not reproducing. But to aid them in sort of vertical, you know, um, um, orientation of getting off the ground, uh, the group of frogs that we refer to as tree frogs have toe pads, sort of the large pads at the tip of their digits that is sort of enlarged in, in spring peepers, but the other tree frog that we have here in Northern New England is the gray tree frog. And you can see they really have these obvious sort of lollipop toe pads um, to aid in going up and down vegetation. Uh, uh, gray tree frogs, again, their common name is, is unfortunate because their scientific name, Hyla versicolor, First color refers to that they can come in a lot of different colors, not just gray, but sort of green. They got these splashes of yellow here on the underside of their thigh. And here's another one that's sort of brownish. And they just love the clasp things. So gray tree frogs are like little puppies, like in yellow. They just love to sort of cling to their thumb and they would sit there all evening. Um, and uh, be totally content. Um, both spring peepers and gray tree frogs are also species of frogs that freeze in the winter time. Uh, those two species do not dive underwater under ice um, to escape uh, freezing temperatures. They allow their body water to freeze. All right, on the turtles. All right, as we sort of go through our you know list here, um, this is the eastern box turtle which is state listed as endangered. It's probably the most threatened, it's the most threatened turtle species and probably the most threatened species of herps that we have here in Maine, that includes both the amphibians or reptiles, because it's in the extreme sort of northern edge of, it, of its range. Habitat destruction also contributes to its rarity, but it's just here, it's just, you know, making its way, you know, as far north as it can possibly go. And many of the state biologists or the state biologist who works on turtles thinks that probably a good number of box turtles that we have in Maine are release pets. Uh, they're very common in the pet trade because they're really attractive turtles. And, um, and we may see because they have a really funky distribution, just release pets here and there. Probably may be true of some, but not all. 
But um, I wanted to show you this because in 1998, somebody brought a box turtle to me over at the museum and they found it on uh, Breakneck Road, um, walking down, I think near where Rocky Man's studio is. And they brought it to the museum and I photographed it. And um, to photograph it, then I released it back there. Um, and then in 2020, I got a email and a video from somebody who said his daughter found a box turtle crawling along Gilbert Farm Road. And so this is a, just a sort of clip from the video. I think it's the same turtle. Yeah. Um, because box turtles have a unique marking or pigmentation on their shell. Each turtle is unique. And um, I just, I don't know, I look at that and I see that. Yeah and see that and see that yeah. and um so 22 years later box turtles can live you know if we let them you know 80 90 maybe 100 years so i bet it's the same individual that's still here yeah. that's a fair distance right yeah, yeah. yeah I know. <laughs> so one turtle that does well in cold and is more threatened by habitat alteration than it is by temperatures like box turtles is the spotted turtle. We don't have the spotted turtle, unfortunately, on the island. It's more in southern Maine, but this is an incredibly beautiful turtle. Um, and so much so, it's highly sought after in the pet trade. What's curious about it is that when it comes out in the spring and starts making its way to sort of the uplands to, um, to feed and to breed, it stops along the way in vernal pools where spotted salamanders are breeding. So where there is, are found, it's not unusual to see in vernal pools, spotted salamanders that have a black background and yellow dots and spotted turtles that have a black background and yellow dots mm -hmm. in the same pool. These do not like heat. They love the cool temperatures. When it gets hot in Maine, for Maine hot, they hunker down and just try to escape the heat. So these are a cool weather turtle. Here's the Eastern painted turtle. I'm sure most of you see they're very common. Uh, and uh, they also do well in the cold. Uh, and I'll just sort of show you this video clip of one early winter I was at. Okay. And the hunt are down in a comatose state and they just took a wait out. Not true. They move around and ice fishermen see them moving around and swimming around and you know presumably they're looking for food or whatever. Um, painted turtles are under the ice as long as there's ice. So you know, in a typical Maine winter, which I hope we have for a long time, that can be many, many months. And uh, turtles have lungs and they need the lungs. They use their lungs to breathe. So how do they breathe while they're under ice? And the answer is they don't. They hold their breath for months. <laughs> so they move around. So where do they get the energy? They get the energy from anaerobic metabolism which can make energy without the use of oxygen. The only hitch there, well, there's two hitches. One is you don't make as much energy. And the other hitch is that you generate lactic acid, um, which can lower the pH of blood and, and tissue. So painted turtles liberate calcium from their shell to buffer that lactic acid. Yes. In the time. Yes. Oops. All right, from turtle um to snapping turtles which um are also fairly common on the island um snapping turtle turtles have been around for a long time 300 million plus years before the dinosaurs and they sort of settled on this body plan of a shell and and laying eggs and depositing the eggs and leaving and let the eggs you know defend for themselves and it's worked and whether you live on land as a turtle, whether you are tied to fresh water to a certain degree, or even salt water, um, that's how you kind of live out your life. For a long time, females lay a lot of eggs on land and hope that some of the eggs 
um, make it. And snapping turtles, you know, sort of have a really prehistoric look to them. However, I'm here to um, argue that as hatchlings, they're pretty cute, <laughs> just like all turtles. And um, and um, I guess that's the point I want to make. <laughs> 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 yeah. They they do this. They're on land because they feel so vulnerable. They are so sort of you know made for being in the water when they come on land really only to for the female to lay eggs is when they feel so vulnerable that they you know snap painted turtles lay their eggs <clears throat> uh snapping turtles lay their eggs in early summer they you know they develop and then they hatch out september-ish and excavate themselves from the nest and make their way to a pond snapping turtles painted turtles lay their eggs around the same time, the eggs develop, the hatchlings hatch out, but they stay in their terrestrial nest over winter. And there's this, you know, some disagreement as to whether the hatchling painted turtles <clears throat> are freeze tolerant, they can tolerate body, their body uh, water freezing, or whether they have mechanisms that allow them to, um, uh, to uh, lower the freezing point of their body water um, to deal with temperatures that would in their nest that would be below freezing. Um, and there's also some uh, evidence to suggest that those hatchlings that are on top of the uh, of the uh, um, incubation burrow, they perhaps get nailed by the cold, but the ones below don't. They're below the frost line. But they come out of the nest with the spring rain. So the same spring rains that trigger spotted salamanders and wood frogs, also trigger the painted turtle hatchlings to dig themselves out and make their way to uh, to um, to water. And why do they do that? All right, snakes. Over the years, I'll confess that um, uh, I have I don't know become more and more fascinated with snakes. I still like frogs. Still like lizards. But I've become more and more fascinated with snakes. They just, because they're, you know, I mentioned in earlier how I find herps in general, you know, intriguing because they're so different than us. Is anything more different than us than a snake? They like legs, they just their whole sort of state of being of how they sense the world with their tongue. Um, and uh, uh, just, you know, and, and, Becoming fascinated with snakes in Maine is a great state to do that in because we have no venomous snakes. Um, and perhaps the most pugnacious snake that we have in Maine, although it's restricted to Southern Maine, is the black racer. It gets long, you know, several feet long. It doesn't like to be picked up. And, uh, and you know, it can be snappy. Uh, it's beautiful. Um, but um, but all the other snakes lend themselves to close inspection. This is the eastern milk snake, a beautiful snake, isn't it? It's just gorgeous. We have here in the island, uh, and uh, the red-bellied snake um, is all these snakes. Eastern milk snake uh, is one that I notice with climate change that you're seeing more and more in the island, they like heat. And so it needs to be a hot main summer to see them, you know, than just the really occasional sighting of a, uh, of a milk snake. And last summer we had a pretty warm summer and both seeing them and also getting reports of people seeing them because people see them and they think it's a rattlesnake, right? And when they feel threatened, they they shake their tail, and if there's dry leaf litter nearby, it can sort of sound like a rattle in a park. I know the park always gets reports that somebody's seen a rattlesnake on the tree. The red belly snake is one that is common, but you have to look for it. They like cover objects. Um, and these are just, you know, diminutive, just beautiful, placid reptiles to admire. Um, you don't see them like this. I pose it this way, They're, so you can see the red belly that they don't come to with their body like that. Another snake that has a gray or dark dorsal uh, 
side, but then a contrasting sort of orange or orange is red ventral side is the ring neck snake. And they do contort their body because <clears throat> when they feel threatened, they hide their head and they coil the tip of their tail to sort of flash this contrasting color to a potential predator. We think probably to direct the attention of the predator, if it has color vision, away from the head. But for my money, the smooth green snake is just a drop dead gorgeous <laughs> snake that um, is found here in Maine. Very tropical looking. And Mount Desert Island has a, um, has a robust population of uh, smooth green snakes. They're real, they're, they have a wide distribution um, across the United States from the Eastern seaboard out to uh, the Rocky Mountains but they have this really disjunct. And along the Eastern seaboard, Maine and Mount Desert Island in particular has a higher density of smooth green snakes um, than other parts. I've had researchers come as far as way as South Dakota because they heard that you can see smooth green snakes on Mount Desert Island. So we have that to, you know, our claim. You, know. um, you often don't see them because they're often in green grass and they just sort of blend in. Um, all the snakes that I showed you lay eggs except for the uh, red belly snake. They give birth to live young. And uh, they're not the only snake in Maine that does that. The uh, banded water snake also gives birth to live young. All right, I am going to, with the time, uh, segue into showing you some pictures of some tropical species that I've encountered in my travels to Central America. And um, this is the American toad. It's not a tropical species. It's, we have this in Maine, um, but I'm starting out with this because toads in North America are very toad-like. They have warty skin that, that is uh, prominent skin glands, um, and that's characteristic. That's how you tell whether a frog's a toad or not. Look for the sort of bumpy, warty skin that uh, is housing skin uh, um, uh, glands. This is a male calling. In the tropics, there are toads that are related to our American toads that don't look like this. This is a toad found in Central America. I shot this picture in Panama, where it has a much smoother skin. It has sort of remnants of the prominent paratoid gland right here. But this particular species has evolved to be one in which it sort of mimics leaf litter. So if you sort of view it from a different, this is all the same species. Some of them have this stripe, maybe, you know, reminiscent of a leaf, like name vein, but um, are there camouflage and they live in their diurnal, they're active during the day and they, um, yeah, they um, one could, I think, reasonably surmise that they, um, um, uh, it's all anti-predator to um, blend in with the leaf litter. This is a tree frog wow. that lives in the leaf litter in the tropics. You can see the prominent toe pads right there, but it also mimics dead leaves. This is another tree frog that would be not closely, but close enough related to gray tree frogs. Um, not so much spring peepers, but gray tree frogs that like a toad has bumpy skin that doesn't house uh, skin plants, glands, but it's probably there to be camouflaged. It looks very kind of lichen-like. And you see the extensive webbing between its, its digits and it can glide from tree to tree. You may have heard of gliding frogs in Southeast Asia, but there are also some that aren't quite as adept at it, but they can still do so. In the tropics, a lot of species, quite a few species of frogs have four gone, going to water to lay their eggs. They lay their eggs on land. Again, we have the four-toed salamander that doesn't lay eggs in the water, and we have the red-backed salamander, um, but all of those eggs are in, you know, sort of close to the ground. In the tropics, um, a, a number of species of frogs lay their eggs on leaves or the underside of leaves. And um, there can be parental attendance and in quite a few species of frogs that do so, it's the male that stays around, not the female. Here's a male, it's a glass frog. 
that is a group of frogs that's confined in the tropics. Unfortunately, we don't have any glass frogs here in North America. Um, they're just beautiful little kind of delicate frogs that are only like an inch or inch or a half long. And they're called glass frogs because they have no pigmentation on their ventral side. So you can see right through, through their organs. Um, but here's a male calling for another female. And while doing so, he's tending eggs from a previous mating. Um, so um, eggs that are, that are laid or borely are not always attended. Here are some other pictures of, this is another type of glass frog that lays it on the tip of a leaf. And as the tadpoles develop, eventually gravity and their movement forces them to sort of drip down into underlying water <clears throat> on their own. This is an egg mass that's laid on the underside of a leaf that they are developing um, embryos of the famous red-eyed tree frog. Um, and they will develop like these glass frogs to a certain point, and then they will sort of pop out of their jelly capsule into underlying water. However, without adults in attendance to defend them in any way, these are subject to being preyed upon, especially by snakes. And studies have been done to show that these tadpoles, as they're developing, you can call them tadpoles, and they can sense vibration in the leaf that's created by the snake sort of cruising um, the, uh, um, the understory where they can lay their eggs and that um, they can detect the vibration of a snake. But if you try to mimic it by doing this, they know it's not the snake and they will pop out prematurely just to get away from the snake and, um, and complete their development in the water below so that they're feed into the environment beyond this jelly capsule um, when it comes to uh, predation. This is a species of lungless salamander in the tropics that's related to redback salamanders and four toed salamanders. Salamanders are not that common in the, in the New World tropics. There are far more frogs than there are salamanders. In fact, there are a lot more salamanders in the United States and North America than there are in any other place in the world. Um, but of, of the salamanders found in the tropics, a number of them have become very tree frog-like. Look at the toes. They sort of evolved these sort of toe pads that allow them to stay up in the vegetation. So this is a truly arboreal salamander. It never comes down in the leaf litter. And it makes its way, you know, through the vegetation with the help of these, you know, adhesive toe pads. Here's another species of lungless salamander. Here you can see the toe pad right there. It's amazing. It's amazing to see that, it, you know, growing up, you know, either, you know, in the, in the Eastern United States or in Maine where you, you know, you got to do this to find a salamander, right? You got to bend over and turn over rocks and lugs. But here, down in charge, you can look around and I get ID level and try to find them. All right. Um, second to the last slide is a species of snake uh, down in the tropics. And no, this is not a coral snake. Um, it's a coral snake mimic that happens to be the same species as our Eastern milk snake. So this is the milk snake, this is a milk snake. Um, milk snakes have a wide distribution and in some parts of their distribution, the populations have evolved to be coral snake mimics. It's true in the tropics, it's also true in the United States, out in the, in the uh, uh, especially in the Southwestern United States. So, um, I was really happy to find this, and I was happy to know that it wasn't a coral snake <laughs> because, thankfully, the milk snake coral mimic holds to the rule that the red doesn't touch the yellow, but that doesn't always hold. It. <laughs> All right, getting towards six thirty, and I want to end by asking a question that's often asked of me, and that is, it's like, what's your favorite salad? What's your favorite amphibian or your favorite reptile? And I do have some favorites, but I got to tell you, after nearly 30 years of teaching, um, actually more than that, because I taught middle school and high school before I came to College of the Atlantic, my favorite amphibian or reptile are the ones that are in the hands of students. <laughs> and uh, I have, um, 
you know, thoroughly enjoy teaching herpetology at College of the Atlantic and being able to teach other young adults and children um, about amphibians and reptiles and just seeing their faces is just takes me back to my youth that's what it does so maybe it's you know self-serving but hopefully not all self-serving but just takes me back to my youth of just like seeing you know that of everything that you could be potentially interested in today and consuming your time if there are those who choose to you know at some point focus on a spotted salamander or frog or even the egg masses of uh, a spotted salamander to learn about them and maybe not even that much but just appreciate them and know that they're out there especially in a state of Maine where you got to sort of hunt you know for them uh, that um, warms my heart all right with that I would be glad to take any questions that you have about anything that I said or anything that I showed you um, or really anything else. And thank you for your attention in the room and out there in Zoom land. So, uh, yes. Oh, good. Um, how far on land would a snacking turtle go? I'm interested to um, Females not far from the water to lay their eggs. Um, you can see them crossing roads. In fact, I saw one crossing the road just the other day. You know, we've had such a warm fall. Um, rain will, rain followed by kind of humid, you know, conditions will bring out both males and females, usually more sub-adults, you know, and juveniles wandering around. And I'm not sure what they're doing. It's outside the breeding season. Um, but, uh, and they're, you know, a fair distance. I can't give you an exact distance, but they can venture a fair distance away. And, you know, and I usually see them crossing roads. And they can, yeah. What is the yep, they can, yeah. Yeah, they're not looking for food because they feed in the water. They're scavengers, you know. Again, their reputation sort of thing. Well, they're actively after fish or you or whatever, but they scavenge, yeah. I've read a study where it's shown that snappers can uh, travel several kilometers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in some cases, that's going to hibernation. Mm -hmm. In other cases, it's females yeah. returning yeah. to the traditional yeah. sites. Yeah, yeah. They overwinter under under ice. Yeah, but maybe just to find a new. Yeah, yeah. What also can prompt them, I know, is when a beaver impoundment, you know, will uh, the dam breaks. And all of a sudden, water levels really drop. That they'll, you know, they need to vacate and find someplace else. You had a question. Yeah. Do uh, freshwater turtles have the uh, sex determined by temperature as do? They do. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The question is, is whether freshwater turtles, um, the developing hatchlings, their sex is determined by the temperature at which they are developing. And the answer is yes. Thank you. I forget the rule. I should know that after all these years. I thought females are warm. warmer, males are cooler. That's yeah. the problem with climate change. That's right. Yeah. 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 I do know for marine, certain marine turtles, we now know that there are some all female beaches and all yeah, male beaches. <laughs> uh, when the real snakes look so different, how do you know they're milk snakes? I mean, what repeat milk snakes? The question is, is milk snakes can be so different in their appearance. How do we know that they're milk snakes? Um, molecular data. Yeah. <laughs> and they can interbreed. Yep. We have one question from Carl Little early on. Carl Little, hi Carl. <laughs> he wanted to know, confirm, yes, don't we? Domier, and then is this Bosch? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. That's a far a little question. <laughs> and we also have a question: Where do people, where do pet stores get their toes in from? Interesting. I um, I just recently agreed to volunteer to be part of a state review board to determine what species of amphibians or reptiles, and really every anything else is allowed in the state of Maine or not. And I just I just had my second meeting just yesterday. So I'm learning and it's a rigorous process. And uh, 
The answer is, is that it that uh, that pet stores are not allowed to sell any native species. Um, so they're all non-native, and 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 the determination is is whether those non-native species, <clears throat> the uh, source of them, are captive bred and not wild caught. And if they would escape or be purposely released in Maine, would they survive or not? Um, so the one species of turtle that I starred is the uh, red-eared slider. The red-eared slider, it's, you've probably heard about how um, imperiled turtles are around the world. Um, and it's true, but the red-eared slider is perhaps maybe the most invasive species, <laughs> not of turtles, but could be like one of the, the most invasive species of animals in the world. It is found worldwide. Wow. Through uh, just, it was popular in the pet trade, and I think maybe for food in some areas, and it's just people release them. They're very adaptable, they're everywhere. They truly are around the world. Um, two questions, two questions. We have any bottom turtles in no, we don't. And no. how about wood turtles? We have wood turtles, yes. And again, I'll just, since you mentioned wood turtles, wood turtles are another cold tolerant species that um, we don't have any here on the island. But if you want to see wood turtles, go up to uh, uh, the uh, St. John's uh, watershed up in the county, Aroostook County. And that's where they, they're most numerous that I know of. Yeah. You said there's no bog. Can you repeat that? No bog. No bog turtles. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, one of my students uh, did a little research on looking at like warming water and how quickly like tadpoles develop. Yeah. I'm thinking about vernal pools yep. and the uh, climate change. Yes. There. Do the do they develop quicker when it gets warmer? They do. And like, they, is there uh, like a big point where like it's too fast? No, the tipping point is, is whether it would warm up enough without any rain at the vernal pools, the water would evaporate uh, before that they can get out um, uh, uh, and, you know, and allow enough developmental time, even with warming water, that they reach the point where they have metamorphosed, absorb their gills, and they're ready to go and land. Um, but that, they can speed that up if it's warmer? The, to a point. Um, the to toads are notorious for being indiscriminate where they lay their eggs. And oftentimes they'll lay them on ro in roadside ditches or even like a tire rut, you know, that fills with water and they'll lay their eggs there. And, and even without implicating uh, climate change, the water evaporates and all the eggs die or the tadpoles the just, you know, they just die. And so um, it can accelerate to a certain point, but, but water can evaporate. And the thinking is, is that especially early breeding species like spotted salamanders and wood frogs, that they're gambling, that they breed in vernal pools early in the spring because they lack predators, but that the vernal pool will be lo around long enough for their uh, larval, uh, uh, either frog or salamander, to be able to complete metamorphosis. Doesn't always happen. Yes. I opened my outdoor cellar door once and a ringneck snake yep. fell down yep. in front of me. Lucky and, you. Oh, yep. Yeah. yeah. It was so I was horrified. It, it looked like a streak of lightning, like it was all uh, angled. Yep. And I was looking at it thinking, oh, I killed it in the door. And all of a sudden, it, it's like it melted in front of my eyes and turned back into a yeah. Snake like yeah. That yeah. They can contort their body. Yeah. I, I showed that picture of just the tip of the tail, but can actually that coil can be quite extensive. Yeah. Quite Ring neck snakes, by the way, from the eastern seaboard to the coast of California, they have a really wide distribution. And they seem to get redder as they go east to west. We tend to have sort of pumpkin colored, you know, ventral sides for our ring neck snakes, but they get redder and redder and they're bright right out in California. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, when I went to bring my plants in this fall, I stuck my hand down into a pot that had been on the front porch. What'd up, you find? Up off the ground. Yeah. And there was a little thing in there moving around yeah. that I investigated. 
it seemed to be a spring fever, a little brown frog yep. with an egg size yep. thing. Yep. And I just wondered what the heck he was doing in yep. there with the woods all around. Yep. He ends up on my front porch. Yep. Yep. Was it moist? Yeah. Yep. There you that's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Just quickly, um, for the folks who didn't get this earlier on. Could you tell us what the stars are for? Yes, the black star next to the timber rattlesnake is to denote that it's extirpated from the state. We don't have it, um, but it's always state listed as we had it once and just, <laughs> you know. And the red stars are next to species that are non-native. <clears throat> They've been introduced. The mud puppy um, is confined to the China Lake region down around Augusta. <clears throat> the thinking is that they may have been introduced as bait fishermen because they're kind of, you know, sort of biggish salamanders that uh, largemouth bass love to eat and they've escaped and and, uh, and they haven't really extended their range. And then the other one is the uh, red-eared slider that I mentioned. The pond slider. That's right, yeah. Although in this group that I'm in, there's speculation that we may get a lizard um, because there is a species of European lizard that's popular in the pet trade that we've known for a while that there's an established breeding population in New Haven, Connecticut, around Yale. And I just found out that there's an established population on, in Fenway Park in Boston. So they're cold tolerant because they're found kind of in Northern Europe. So we may get our lizard in Portland someday. Yes. Yeah. Any other things? What were the arrows? Those are arrows all had to do with species that I was highlighting in my talk tonight. Yeah. Question, Jesse, behind the mask. I know from personal experience that when handled, oftentimes garter snakes will secrete a really nasty smell. Yep. Uh, liquid. Yep. yep. Um, I wanted to know what's going on there anatomically and if any other snakes in the region will do that. All the snakes do that. Even our, you know, beautiful ring neck snakes and red belly snakes. Yeah. The, the question is pick, picking up a garter snake. They can extrude the smelly liquid from their vent. And um, what's that all about? And what that all about is, is that you picked up a garter snake and you're scaring the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. And it wants to get away. And it's an anti-predator uh, uh, strategy is to emit that cloacal secretion. So um, both amphibians and reptiles being non-mammals, they have a cloaca, which is a common vent for everything to empty into it. Their urinary, their, their um, uh, 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 reproductive, and their, you know, sort of uh, their gastrointestinal tract all empty into the same cavity and vent. So it's just smearing everything on you. <laughs> <laughs> The cloaca gets, uh, I think it's Greek or Latin for it, sewer. It is, yeah. If you go to Rome, you can see the uh, cloaca maxima, the main sewer of Rome. Yeah. <laughs> you, yes. The focus of your research within um, Acadia. For a while, it was, um, I was working on redback salamanders, and it was, uh, um, and it focused on establishing densities because uh, there was, there was a study done in New Hampshire that determined that redback salamanders, I think I mentioned in passing, is the most numerous vertebrate in northeastern deciduous forest, um, the most numerous carnivore, all right, um, uh, in terms of living biomass. And, and when I came to uh, College of the Atlantic in the early 90s, um, and you know, with Acadia National Park being right next door and talking to wildlife biologists, I was asking them about their herps and, and um, you know, no commentary on Acadia National Park, but they didn't know a whole lot about them because of what I was telling you about their sort of image problem, I think, or just where they could get research money. Um, so they were open to any research on any species of amphibian or reptile. And for a while I was with students doing uh, a study where I put out cover boards, you cut, piece of wood to a certain dimensions and you lay them out and you attract redback salamanders because they think it's fallen logs or whatever. And anyway, we're doing density studies in different parts of the park uh, to see what kind of numbers that we had. 
Um, and more recently, although recently is about the last seven years, I've been studying a population of spotted salamanders that breed next to the ocean. And the question is, is how can they deal with the salt that's getting into their breeding pools? Um, so that's been fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't answer that question because I'm not sure how they deal with the salt. I'm still working on that. But they, they can be exposed to salt. Um, we get a stormy spring and, um, but and it's curious. They just, you know, it's not thought that really any amphibian can deal with salt just because they have that permeable skin, but, um, but they might, which would actually bode well for rising sea levels if, you know, <laughs> Uh, yeah, could tell me that there is. is the crab eating frog there is Southeast Asia, yep. Yep. and they balance the challenge by raising urea to counteract the the uh, salinity of right. the ocean. It used to be that there was a crab eating frog and there was a species of toad mm -hmm. that was salt tolerant. A study came out right as I started working on this population. Like a year later, a review paper came out that documented around 143 species of amphibians. That can tolerate salt so it's not just those one or two that have been um profiled for actually darwin started with darwin he pointed out amphibians are not salt tolerant except for this one um, but now that one is joined by over 140 more yeah. another question yes um, i know sound and frogs is usually something that attracts another species but is there any other type of sexual selection like are the spots like attractive or is that like what, what attracts one to another? Um, it, that often boils down to a species specific. Um, I would say that um, color for um, color for amphibians, not so much so for two reasons. One is that a lot of amphibians breed at night. And that you saw from some of the pictures that color can be really variable. Um, and uh, so uh, in um, frogs, it's acoustic communication, males calling the females. In salamanders, it's chemical. It's males laying down chemical trails. And redback salamanders, <clears throat> females can judge the quality of males based on their poop. <laughs> So, you know, take that for whatever that's for. <laughs> Jesse, yes. Um, so how, how when you're out with students um, handling amphibians, yeah. how do you handle them so yeah. they remain yeah. healthy and intact? Yeah. Yeah. How do you handle them? How do you handle, right, yep. Yeah. That's what hooked me as a kid. And, but I'm fully aware that picking up an animal is, you know, could potentially stress them out. And um, for one thing is that you keep your hands free of chemicals and you keep your hands moist. Um, for frogs, especially bigger frogs like bullfrogs and green frogs and even wood frogs, you hold them by their thighs, you immobilize them. And that way they, you know, the frogs can't move and potentially hurt themselves by trying to jump away. And although it looks, you know, like, I don't know, looks a little, you know, aggressive, that's the best way to look them. Mm -hmm. Salamanders, you just sort of cup your hands. Um, so I think in terms of like, like um, keeping the animals safe, uh, it being an amphibian, I think, you know, chemical free hands and, you know, keeping your hands moist um, is the way to go. Um, there is the question of the animal could still be stressed. And I've had numerous talks with many herpetologists, especially those that are focused more on teaching than research, of like the balance there. If you want to hook people, you know, um, they have to get to know the animal. And, um, and as I said, amphibians and reptiles lend themselves to being held. Um, and so what do you do there? And it's unanimous uh, among herpetologists that I highly respect is that you hold them. 
you know, that seals the deal, mm -hmm. you know, for anybody that's on the fence when you can like just have this incredible animal and acknowledge that yes, that probably the animal is stressed. But um, that prompted me to try to find out as much as I could about stress levels and amphibians, especially doing work in the park. I have to apply for permits and I have to, I have to provide, provide a rationale if I'm going to hold the animal of how I am going to do that with um, minimizing or, you know, totally preventing any injury or stress. And, um, and the bottom line is, is I can't say that I will never stress the animal out because studies, and the only way to quantify that in an amphibian is to draw blood and measure stress hormone mm -hmm. levels. But um, I stumbled on a study that found that, um, that in amphibians, <clears throat> stress hormone levels stay at the same level um, when you're holding them or even injecting them with a tag, you know, to mark them um, as the levels that they experience when they cross the road. So when they move from leaf litter to crossing a road, their stress hormone levels shoot up there. I guess because they're feeling something different without being picked up. They just, they're living in a human dominated world. And um, so I, I, you know, I don't think these animals live a stress-free life until we come along. <laughs> and uh, so I just, I acknowledge, but I, I, you know, again, I, me personally, the, the benefits that can be um, conferred on the human population by having people who otherwise never think about these animals. And I've seen it, you know, I, I don't know, growing up the way I did, and you know how, I don't know, both parents and a teacher, you sort of view your kids or your students as clones of yourself. Like they're interested in the same thing you're interested in. They live the same life you lived. That ain't true. And um, and I've taken students out and we caught frogs or whatever. And I've had students come back and they say, Steve, I called my mom last night. I held a frog. And I told her I held a frog. And I said, well, did you do that as a kid? No. You know, and uh, so... figure that success story. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your questions and your questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.